progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. Shall we ask the Lord's blessing and guidance as we open his word for this morning's study? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you on this Sabbath. We thank you for this day of rest. We thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together to be directed according to your character and your will. For this, Father, we ask. For this, we pray. And for this, we thank you. Because it is only by coming to understand your character that we are going to understand that which you would have us to do and that which is right in your eyes. Direct us now. Help us that these minds that have been darkened by sin for so many thousands of years may be able to understand that which you are presenting in your word. I ask a blessing upon each one assembled here today and for those that will listen to this in the recordings. To this end, I thank you. For this, we pray and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Last week, we left off in Judges 20. Now, as the translators place this in the 1769 Bible, the children of Israel assemble at Mitzpah, before whom the Levite declareth his wrong. How did we define mitzpah last week? Watchtower. And why did we think that a watchtower was important? <clears throat> what did we address? Well, it refers to our time. ties us to Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33. Right. So in this situation, we are looking at a Levite of the tribe of Judah, which is, to me, it's kind of a misnomer because you're either of the tribe of Levi or you are of the tribe of Judah. Right. That seeks for his concubine to return with him, stays with an old man in Gibeah, willingly gives up his concubine to save his own son, finds her dead the next day. returns to his home, and then cuts up his concubine and sends them to all of the tribes. Now the children of Israel are shocked by this. <clears throat> we are seeking to be able to relate this to our time. Mm -hmm. Now, all of the children come together. They listen to what this Levite of Judah has to say. And the resolution of the assembly is to punish the Gibeathites. Why? Well, it has to do with... Um... Um, the directives given by Moses. Correct. So if we go down to Judges 20, verse 8, mm -hmm. 
All of the people arose as one man saying, we will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn into his house. But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. And we will take 10 men of a hundred throughout the tribes of Israel and a hundred of a thousand and a thousand out of 10,000 to fetch food for the people that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin, according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. Folly being wickedness. <clears throat> yes. Yes. The wickedness that was done. So. We are being shown that the same wickedness that brought down Sodom and Gomorrah is what the men of Gibeah sought to do with this Levite from Judah. So there's a question in the chat. Whether or not there's a connection with 1 Samuel 10, verses 17 to 27. Well, that's Saul becoming king. And, and he's... He lives in Gibeah. Okay. Because it says, and Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. So why, I mean, we're, we're going to have to get into why Gibeah is important after we have gone through some other points within this particular chapter. Mm -hmm. So all of the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together of as one man. So if all of the men of Israel were gathered against Gibeah, if the Bible is telling us this, then what tribes were united at this point? Would this verse not indicate that all of the tribes were united at this point? Mm -hmm. Yep. Does that not include the tribe of Benjamin? Um, at this point in the story, yeah, I don't know because I know Benjamin didn't come originally, but it must be include the tribe. Uh, let me see. Oh, it says in um, the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities unto Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities, 26,000 men. Um, I mean, the cross-references that the, the translators had used give us this from Ezekiel about the two sticks. Yeah. Yeah, so Benjamin's going to come and fight against them. Right. <clears throat> so should this verse read all of the men of Israel, or should it read all of the men of Israel except Benjamin? Yeah, well, when it comes to Hebrew, when they use the word all, it doesn't really mean all. Okay. Um, we, we do that sometimes in English, too. We just don't think about it. Well, that's why we're asking questions to think yeah. about. So, 
And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, what wickedness is this that is done among you? And the references here take us back to Deuteronomy 13. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently and behold, if it be truth and the thing be certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly and all that is therein and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. So Moses is very clear. If you find wickedness in a specific city, mm -hmm. inquire, ask diligently. Mm -hmm. Are we not seeing an investigative judgment here? Mm -hmm. So yeah. if the in investigative judgment is proved, what exactly is to be done? Well, then the city is going to be destroyed, the inhabitants. Is that anything different than happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? No. So all came to the tribe of Benjamin. <coughs> They are investigating what is the wickedness that's done among you. The determination is then made. Therefore, deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, and we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. Here we have one against 11. What application can we make at this point with what is going on today? Is the movement not pointing out to the rest of the church that we cannot engage in spiritual formation? Is the movement not hearkening to some of the things that Elder Jeff have said before? just as he had stated almost three years ago, that we cannot engage in political points just as the Omega did. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the issue on those points is what caused a great separation mm -hmm. with other brothers and sisters within this movement. Is this not the evil that we are to put away? Absolutely. <clears throat> But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the city unto Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities, 20 and 6,000 men that drew the sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. So you have 26,700. 
Mm -hmm. And I believe you made the point on this last week, Theodore, that this is representative of the 1335. Yeah, I can't remember how. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there's also a, sorry. There's also a 276 there that will bring us to Acts 27. Okay. So you have 26,700. 26700. Yeah. And among all these people of the 26,700, there were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at a hair breadth and not miss. So if we are associating this with the 1,335. Are we not associating this with the tarrying time that occurred between 1843 and 1844? The time of blessing for those that come unto. Yeah, how, how did I connect this with 1335? I don't remember. I'm just remembering that you did it and that there were several people that were absolutely shocked by it. Good question. I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to watch that video again. Okay, I remember. Good. Two, six, seven times. Five is 1335. But if you also were to take this of the 26,700 and you divide it by two, you come to 13,350. Okay. Yeah. So that'd be sort of the same thing, just in reverse. Because, yeah. Okay. So that's how I equated it. So you have two equations there that bring us to the 1335. Yeah. Which for many is a stumbling block in the book of Daniel because they never can understand why this 1335 is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, and it's, well, five times two, six, seven, which I like the best because that, it gives us that symbol of, of um, the wise and the foolish. Right. Which connects us to 1335, the separation of the two classes. Now, in this, in this story. <clears throat> Sorry, fellas. <laughs> 1335 is in Daniel 12, 12, and 12 times 12 is 144. So it just keeps growing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing puzzling about this, I mean, we know that this evil happened, but we know the Levite, he's he's deceptive. Yes. And and he doesn't reveal his own sin. Um and the investigation. That they're doing here. Um, I don't know if they're investigating properly. How do you mean that? Well, I mean, it doesn't really describe how, how much they investigate. I mean, how much they're looking into it. Are they going to look diligently into what has happened and find out why it's happened. I mean, obviously there's some bad people there in Gibeah, so I'm not arguing that. Um, but I'm, I'm also not sure why the Benjamites aren't trying to address the problem as well. 
there is something very strange about that because yeah. if proof is presented yeah you have choices either you accept the proof or you don't mm -hmm. i don't see that there's a <laughs> go ahead in Judges 20, verse 3, it says the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. If Benjamin was being accused, then why weren't they invited to face their accusers? And when the, when the Levites said, my concubine of the men of Gibeah forced, well, why didn't they ask them? Well, what did you do to protect her? Like, what incited the men of Gibeah to do? Well, I guess they knew they were per perverts and violent, but. I would ask, what, why, what did you do to protect your concubine? Of course, he didn't. In, in the first point, the situation, here are the men of Gibeah coming to look for a relationship, if you can call it that, with this Levite of Judah. Uh -huh. They want a physical interaction with this Levite from Judah that is completely and totally prohibited scripture. Uh -huh. This was what caused the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. And of course, they symbolize church and state. The Levite, the church, Judah, the state. Right. So when this combination is presented of church and state, you have something to question, but the bigger question is, were they to allow this type of interaction to go on within Israel? Was it not completely and totally prohibited by God's law and by the codes that Moses gave to explain the law. Yeah, now the children of Israel don't seem to know that that's the problem. I mean, they're focused upon this concubine that got killed. Right. Um, but they're not really concerned about the Le Levite from Judah. Okay. Now, as we're told, and the men of Israel beside Benjamin were numbered 400,000 men that drew the sword. All of these were men of war. So, of the 11 other tribes, you have 400,000 soldiers. Uh -huh. What can we draw from this? Well, Benjamin's outnumbered. <laughs> well, Benjamin's greatly outnumbered. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> and the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first.
why are we looking at Judah to go up first? Why, why was this God's decision? Why didn't he send Reuben? The oldest. Would it be that because Reuben had committed sin with Jacob's concubine? Possibly. Why not Simeon? Would it be because Simeon was the instigator of the sale of Joseph? Or would it have more to do with the destruction of Shechem and the people of his city because of Dinah? And if then, why not Levi? If Levi was, was to have been chosen, would that not send the message that I am sending those that are my representatives, my priests? Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, with Levi, because they're, they don't have a territory and they have cities throughout all the different tribes i don't know how i'm all i'm trying to do is i'm trying to say okay we're going right down the progression yeah in the birth order mm -hmm. so judah goes up if you look if you look at judges 17 7 it says there was a young man out of bethlehem judah of the family of judah who was a Levite and he sojourned there. And if we're presuming that that's the same Levite that had the concubine that was murdered, mm -hmm. violently raped and murdered, then maybe that's why Judah was first to go up. Okay. That could be. Okay. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. So is the phrase, and the men of Israel, a doubling? Because it's repeated twice. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground the Israelites that day, 20 and 2,000 men. Yeah, now that's a doubling. Okay. 22. It's also interesting because when you're talking 22,000, you have 220 by 100. Mm -hmm. So as we look at this as being a doubling, The children of Benjamin, are they not providing the What do you mean? Well, you have 26,700. Yeah. We've just addressed that as being a symbol of the 1335. Yeah. 
we have 220 multiplied by 100 that is coming against the 1335. Those of Judah are being defeated by those of Benjamin. Yeah. The larger is being beaten by the smaller. I also find it interesting here that this is Judges 2021. Whether or not there's something specific about that weird to note, I don't know. Hmm. So the translators bring us back to Genesis 49, verse 27. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour his prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. What is this Hebrew word translated as raven? Or raven. Maybe ravage, ravage or something. Uh, Just guessing. Okay. Well, let me see. Okay, well, to pluck off or pull to pieces, to supply, supply with food. Hmm. Yeah, so tear apart just as a wolf would tear apart its prey. Okay. Okay, so that reminds me of what Ellen White warned about the false preachers, peace and safety, no Sunday law, and blah, blah, blah. That, that eventually the congregations would tar- tear them into pieces because of their deceits. Okay. And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle array, their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. So we have the people, the men of Israel. Why are they encouraging themselves? What is this telling us? Well, the word actually can refer to obstinacy. means to fasten upon. Okay. Is that similar to what we find with David in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6? Yeah, it's the same word. But I mean, the way that David is dealing with this is different. It is. He's fastening himself there upon what the Lord was saying. Yeah. Is this in the same manner that we're seeing with this with the men of Israel? Are they fastening upon God or are they fastening upon their own power? Yeah, their their own power. (laughs) 
Yes, I know it says their battle, and then it says where they put themselves in array. It doesn't say God did it. Right. The point that the point that we're addressing, right? Judges 20, 23. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord saying, shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, go up against him. And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground the children of Israel again, 18,000 men, all that drew the sword. So how many men have now been destroyed by the 26,700? Uh, 40,000. Why is that important for us to note? So far, Benjamin has destroyed 10% of those that are arrayed against them. Mm -hmm. That's quite a bit for such a small band to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know how many of the children of Benjamin were killed. It doesn't tell us. Not yet. So if we look with the translators, they come back and they give us this, this reference again to the 22,000 mm -hmm. destroyed. So we know that there are of this 26,700, that there has been 40,000 destroyed or 10% of that allied against them. Mm -hmm. So now we come to the point, the verses that are going to support the premise stated at the outset of this study. Then all of the children of Israel and all of the people went up and came unto the house of God. They came unto Bethel and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. What day did they come to the house of the Lord, where they fasted until even. Third day? The third day. What are we addressing as being important about the third day? Uh, time of waiting or, uh, yeah, uh, tarrying. Does this also not give us another point and example with what we have addressed from the book of Ezra. Where the men and Judah of, of Judah and Benjamin are brought before the house of the Lord in the hard rain. So this is occurring on the third day. Does anyone have any other different opinion? Not so much uh, uh, about the third day, but because it says that they fasted the entire day until the even, that reminds me of the, of the uh, Day of Atonement, where the people were fasting and they gathered themselves before the Lord and they examined themselves. The day of afflicting the soul. Okay. 
How does this relate with us today? Well, that's what we're supposed to be doing, examining ourselves daily and daily repenting, being reconverted. But how can we apply this within the movement right now? So aren't we afflicted at this point? I mean, we're having trouble trying to understand stuff. We're, we're doing those same things that the, um, the Israelites were doing. I would agree. Is this also not representative of what was occurring on the ninth day? with the disciples and those in the upper room the ninth day after Christ's ascension back to heaven. Yeah, and we, we determined that that nine days was broken down into three threes, right? Well, I would assume so. There is some somewhat of a parallel there. I'm not willing to um, overextend myself on that. Okay, so we are then shown, and the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant was there in those days. Where was the Ark of the Covenant in those days? Shiloh? Are we not shown that they came unto the house of God? I mean, the house of God here, if we reverse translate it, would that not be Bethel? Yes. But this would be at Shiloh, though. Okay. It seems as though it's Shiloh. Because it's supposed to be at Shiloh in this period of time. That's what I thought. So in the early days of the nation of Israel, the ark would have been at Shiloh the entire time? Mm -hmm. Well, they weren't carrying it into battle. Right. I would agree. So that would mean that it was being protected at Shiloh, if I'm not mistaken. Because Joshua 18, verse 1, the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. Um, you're going to see when it's removed from Shiloh. Come on, Ron. Yeah, so this is where God has put the ark here. It's at Shiloh. So they've so they would have gone to Shiloh. Now, where's Shiloh in relationship to these places? I thought Shiloh was in uh, Persian Persian uh, territory. Hmm. No. Or Babylonian territory. No, it's north of Bethel. Uh, so you got uh, Gibeah, and then you go north is Ai, and then Mizpah. Bethel, and then Shiloh's north of that. So they would have had to have repaired to the north. Yeah. They would have gone from the south to the north. Yeah. Yeah, Mizpah is about halfway between Gibeon, Gibeah and Shiloh. Uh, do you know what the physical distance is? Um. I can look it up. Uh, 
because they were in Gibeon, Gibeah, and then they went to Shiloh and then came back. Yeah, well, they're and they're at Mizpah too, right? So. It's uh, uh, the watchtower. Right. Yeah. Um, well, right from Gibeah to Shiloh is about uh, 25 miles. That's definitely doable in a day. So if we're talking 25 miles, we're talking five times five of, you know, wise and foolish. Yeah, it's 10 miles north of Bethel. Okay. 20 miles north of Jerusalem. Okay. It said the whole house. What, what did it say again? The whole house went back? The verse, the verse reads, Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God, and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. That's a big crowd to go, what is it, 50 miles round trip? Well, yeah, I don't know if they're going to do 50 miles round trip. Well, they, the question, Not in one day, not in one day. Yeah. yeah. So the point being that all of the children of Israel, the ones that have assembled at Mitzpah against Benjamin, mm -hmm. is now reduced to 360,000 men. Mm -hmm. So you have the symbol of a prophetic year. Mm -hmm. mm. This symbol is then to go from the house of God, from Beth El, to Shiloh. So, how far would we be talking from Beth El to Shiloh? Um. Maybe about five miles at worst. Yeah. yeah. So even if even if we're going to consider this to be three hundred and sixty thousand men making a journey of five miles is not that great. No, not at all. Now the question would become. Since they have wept and sat there before the Lord at Bethel and fasted that day until even, we know that they're coming to the fourth day because this is the activity of the third day. Would you agree or disagree? Mm -hmm. Reasonable. So on the fourth day, the children of Israel inquire of the Lord for the Ark of the Covenant was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it, the Ark, in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? So who is asking the question of God before the ark? The priest. Phinehas, right? Phinehas, the priest, yes. Phinehas was Aaron's grand, right? Correct. Now, the premise that was made is that Judges 17 to 21 should not have been placed at the end of the book of Judges, because if we have studied what Brother Stephen has presented in his tabled history, 
we know that this time period of judges could have been greater than 390 years. Phinehas, Aaron's grandson, was noted and noted greatly during the time of Moses. For what reason? Was it not Phineas that put the spear through the man of Judah that was so willing to bring a Midianite woman into his tent before all of the children of Israel? That story sounds familiar. Well, if we what's our reference? Okay, so let's go. Let's go down to what the uh, the translators show. Mm -hmm. Joshua twenty two thirteen, and the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the half tribe of Manasseh into the land of Gilead, Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest. Now, how long did Moses live? Did he not live for 120 years? Yep. Right. How long did Joshua live? 110. Okay. Have we, are we not seeing this then that the time in which men could live at this at this point could, 360 huh did it total the 360 is that what you're saying no i'm not i'm not looking at that at all i'm looking at how long these men could live at that point i mean yes yeah, phineas that, that's why you're saying this is earlier it's at, at the time right after the death of joshua correct yeah because Phineas is still a high priest. So if Phineas is the high priest, we could establish that, you know, he could live potentially for 120, maybe a little bit more, but 120 years. Yeah. We could not look at this in Judges as being toward the end of a 390 year span because that would mean that Phineas would have been over 400 years old. Mm -hmm. So Phineas is here. Mm -hmm. He is the high priest. He is standing before the ark. The men of Israel, the, three, the 360,000 are before him. Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, go up for tomorrow. I will deliver them into thine hand. And Israel set liars in wait around Gibeah. They were going to trap the men of Gibeah. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in array against Gibeah as at other times. So help me understand. Are we saying that this is three days after they have left? Shiloh? How mm -hmm. are we to read this?
You don't know. Doesn't make sense. Uh, would that be three days after the consultation of the Lord? That um, would make sense. I mean, it could just refer to the third day that they have a battle, not necessarily three consecutive days. True. Okay. Because it doesn't add up to me otherwise. This is another one of those verses that makes me more greatly appreciate the work that Stephen has done in his tabled history. Yeah. Because I'm starting to see this, like the first day would be like starting at noon or something like that. And then the last day ending at noon, but there's only like a day between it. I mean, but they make that three day count. Right. So again, here we are presented with another third day. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be like the first day they go into battle, the second day they go into battle, and the third day they go into battle. Not necessarily that this happens in a period of three days. And that sounds logical as well. But it still has the symbol of the third day. And the way they're they're doing this battle reminds me of what they did with AI too. I mean, after they repented, then they had had the triumph, right? But it wasn't until they sought the Lord that they they won. They you know they set set am, am, ambushments and uh, di diverted the people from AI and then slaughtered them. Well, that you know that was one of the points that that was being made on Thursday. Because the battle against AI was one where AI, along with the men of Bethel, along with that from the house of the Lord, came together. And those from Bethel had to go through those that were laying in wait. So, and the children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city and began to smite of the people and kill as at other times in the highways of which one goeth up to Bethel and the other to Gibeah in the field about 30 men of Israel. So what I'm reading here is that the 26,700 are now taking part in the death of 30 men. Of these 30 men, are these representative of, let's say, the price of a slave for the layers in weight to pull off their deception? You mean a feigning? Uh, something words to uh, set a for them as to they feigned that they were losing and the other guys jumped on them? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. But I mean, I see 30 men and the biggest 30 that I know of in the New Testament is the 30 pieces of silver that were paid to betray Christ. Well, the concept is working for me, the, um, the bait and switch. Okay. 
So the 30 men are left as basically bait. That's what it would appear to be. Okay. And the children of Benjamin said, they are smitten down before us as at the first. But the children of Israel said, let us flee and draw them from the cities into the highways. Is this not the same as we were addressing regarding those of Bethel and Ai that came up against the children of Israel? Mm -hmm. because they drew those men out of the city. So here, those of the tribe of Benjamin defending those of Gibeah think that they've got the battle. They've got, they proved their point. Let's, let us flee. They definitely displayed overconfidence. Yeah, they are, they're very overconfident. And the children of Israel Let's turn our backs to them. Let them think that we're running away. And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place and put themselves in array at Baal Tamar. And the liars in wait of Israel came forth out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah. Have we got a translation on Baal Tamar? Well, this would be the god of something. So what what do we oh. say? Huh? The Lord of Tamar. Okay. I, mean, I don't know who Tamar is. Uh, uh, just a note, in Bishop's Bible, it says instead of third day, it says third. Okay. And... That's a translation that predates the King James. Okay. He was tracking like you were tracking, Theodore. So Baal Tamar, or as as you would as we would look at this from the Hebrew, Baal Tamar, yeah. possessor of the palm tree. So the Tamar is a palm tree. Okay. Lord, Lord of the Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued by that, given the Tamar that we find in Genesis. Yeah. So we have the Gibeathites and the Benjamites thinking that they're winning the battle. The men of Israel rose, rise up out of their place. They put themselves in array at the God of the palm tree. And all of the men come out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah. So the Benjamites were really not paying attention. Because if you've got men arising out of the meadows... Aren't they really hiding in plain sight? Would appear. Um, but a meadow implies that it's grown with, you know, flowers and uh, grass that could be tall at that time. All right. And there came against Gibeah 10,000 chosen men out of all of Israel. And the battle was sore, but they knew not that evil was near them. So you have 10,000 against 26,700. A much smaller force against a much greater force. And if you, I mean, a lot of the stuff that went on has gone on with low numbers because uh, 
the Lord wants you to know it came from him and not from men. Right. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel. And the children of Israel destroyed of the Benjamins, Benjamites that day 25,100 men, all these that drew the sword. So, if we have in this point 26,700, and we yeah. have now destroyed 25,100. You got 1,600 left. So we have 1,600 remaining. And the liars in wait hastened and rushed upon Gibeah, and the liars in wait made a long sound with the trumpets and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. why i like these alternate readings mm -hmm. because it, it gives you a few other details that some of the others don't give okay from the chat the comment is made that we should refer to psalm 92 12 that the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree and the comment is also made that Jericho was known as the city of the palm tree from Deuteronomy 34, verse 3. So an alternate reference about this with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast from the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the, whale of the, the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So, the liars in wait make the blast from the trumpet. We're not being told that it's the Levites. We're not being told that it's of the children of Israel. It's those that were set aside that were laying in wait around Gibeah. Now there was an appointed time between the men of Israel with the liars in wait that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. Now, the liars in wait of Ai began to burn that city. And when the men of Bethel and the men of Ai turned around, they saw the destruction that had been befallen this city. And we can find that when we look at Joshua 8.14. And when it came to pass, when the king of Ai saw it, that they hastened and rose up early, and the men of the city went out against Israel to battle, he and all his people, at a time appointed, before the plain. But he wist not that there were liars in ambush against him behind the city. And when the men of Israel retired in the battle, Benjamin began to smite and kill of the men of Israel about 30 persons. For they said, surely they are smitten down before us as in the first battle. So 
So they were smiting the wounded, the 30, the sacrificial ones. But when the flame began to arise up out of the city with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them. And behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven, or the consumption of the city ascended up to heaven. What would you do in a situation like this? If you're, if you're in battle, all of a sudden you think you're winning and you turn around and your entire city is being destroyed. Uh, I would figure that I've been tricked and I would start heading back to the city to take care of the people that were smiting it. I think that's, that's me. what they did here too. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin, for they saw that evil touched them. You're beaten. What else are we to do? Therefore, they turned their backs before the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness but the battle overtook them and them which came out of the cities they destroyed in the midst of them. Thus they enclosed the Benjamites round about and chased them and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. Now, there's a Hebrew word that gets referenced here. What is manuka? Mm. Why is that important for us to know? So that's the word that's translated as ease. Okay. Um, means rest, comfortable, ease, quiet, still. God said, woe to them that sit at ease in Zion. And also when it mentions the pillar of smoke, well, I'm not only thinking, but I'm also thinking of Nashville. Okay. So here we're being shown that the children of Israel have encompassed around the Benjamites. They are beating them down with ease. It's not taking a lot of effort. They are here over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. So what direction does the sun rise? It comes from the east. So can we say that they are going from the west to the east? Would that be correct? Mm -hmm. Yep, well, it should mean that. Okay. Towards the sun rising. And there fell of Benjamin 18,000 men. All these were men of valor. Now, we were just addressing this, that there were 25,100 that fell. Mm -hmm. 
Now there's 18,000. That's quite a difference. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness unto the rock of Rimon. And they gleaned of them in the highways 5,000 men and pursued hard against them unto Gidom and slew 2,000 men of them. Yeah, now that would be 18,000 that fell in this in the field. Okay. Um, so, and here it's using a word. Um, Yeah, when it takes that they gleaned of them 5,000 of them in the highway. So that's 18,000 in the field, 5,000 in the highways. Right. Is that what it's saying? That's what I would think. 23,000 right there. Yeah. Yeah, so it's going to say... Uh, yeah, 25,000 men that drew the sword. Okay. So it's just dividing them up in this way. Okay. So they f and fled toward the wilderness unto the rock of Ramon. What does this mean? What is the Rock of Rimon? One that well, is marked off? Yeah. Um, yeah, it means marked off, but it's, uh, it's also the name of a Syrian deity and five places in Palestine. Okay. And pursued hard after them unto Gida or Gidom, which can mean a cutting or a desolation. So all which fell that day of Benjamin were 20 and 5,000 men that drew the sword. All of these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness unto the rock Rimon and abode in the rock Rimon four months. Was there not a point where Elder Jeff was being clear that four months is five months? Did he not make that application? What, well, how is he making that application in what context? Well, part of it had to do with his five months of not saying anything and letting Parminder and Tess have basically the stage. He was also making a point regarding the five months of hiding of Elizabeth. Okay. Why would you say four months? I'm asking the question, didn't he make a point like that, that four months is five months? I don't recall that. I, I don't remember it. All right. Maybe I'm wrong. 
Unless I'm forgetting something. So we have these men that are going out into this desolate area for four months. And the men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword, as well as the men of every city, as the beast and all that came or was found came to hand. And also they set on fire all of the cities that they came to or the cities that were found. So the children of Israel are practicing what we would call scorched earth. What was that last word? Scorched earth. Oh. From the chant, we're given a uh, we're given a verse of John four thirty five. So as I look that up. John 4, verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are already white, already to harvest. So these men are in the wilderness for four months. The application and the example is being that this is equivalent to time of harvest. So here we're to the point where all of the children of Benjamin that remain are 600. We now have the cities of Benjamin being destroyed. That means that all their children, their wives, everything is now gone. Wasn't it possessions as well? Everything. Nothing left. Who does Benjamin represent? That's, I think, the question we're going to have to determine. Could it be the mainstream church? Who are, the, who are the different things that this could represent? Mainstream church could be one. For this time period, I mean, the logic on that is the church has allowed things to occur that are prohibited within scripture. They've allowed churches to be established that are completely against God's word. So there's, there are points with this story that have a lot of depth that I don't think that we've ever really considered before. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions that we have here? <clears throat> Any other points that we're looking at? Did 
they were smaller in number. Right. So we have a we have a question right now. Is the children of Benjamin representing the mainstream church? Does that then mean the men of Israel is represented by the movement? Uh, Israel means uh, Prince of God, you know, he that prevails against God in a sense. So that's what we should be doing. I mean, we should have the spirit of, of, of Jacob when he was wrestling with Christ. Okay. Also, I'm looking at Genesis uh, 35, 16 and on down. And okay. they journeyed from Bethel and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel prevailed and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said on her, for not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in the parting, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. I find it interesting that Benjamin being the son of my right hand. Yeah. Yet there are those that were noted within the tribe of Benjamin as being left-handed that could sling a stone and not miss. So we are now at nine o'clock. Any other thoughts or any other comments at this point? Um, I just got one. Um... I don't seem to see this document in my uh, list of notes from you. Did you send this out? I'm emailing it out right away. I'm sorry, you did? No, I'm going to email it out. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't. I'm a little on the depth side. Well, a lot on the depth side. Okay. Anything else? Okay, shall we close with prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this lesson that you are presenting, and we're thanking you for the questions that it is raising. Guide us, direct us, and help us now. Be with us as we study. Be with us in the lessons that will be presented today. For those that are traveling, we pray for traveling mercies. And ask that we are able to come again together safely. We thank you for the Sabbath day. Help us now that we may truly have this Sabbath rest, but also that we may enter into a time where we may come to understand that which you are presenting more and more clearly. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Recording stopped.